we will be, uh, Jen, if you don't mind starting the record. Great, awesome, and we are recording now. Uh, let me go back. Great, so I want to start, um, of course, with, with land acknowledgement. So I will invite uh, Jen um, to unmute your mic and then share the land acknowledgement with us. Thank you, Jay. As all of you join us today for a teaching on the settler colonial strategies on occupied lands, I find it important and necessary to connect the decolonial struggles across the globe and also recognize the transnational indigenous solidarity from Turtle Island to Palestine. So I'm joining you today from Tocanto, colonially known as Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The word Tocanto in Mohawk means where there are trees standing in the water. Today, Tocanto is covered under Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaty. It is the traditional territories of the many First Nation peoples, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. As I'm joining you virtually today, these nations continue to experience ongoing colonization and displacement, where land acknowledgements are offered in place of the land itself. Remember, we, we remember those who came here involuntarily, particularly those brought to this land as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. Cities across Turtle Island were built on stolen land and stolen labor of Black, Indigenous, and racialized people. What we now refer to as Canada was also built on the labor of many immigrant and migrant communities. From the transcontinental railroad to farming and food production to the country heavily, the country heavily relied and continues on the talent, skills and hard work of racialized people. In exchange, many of them are denied residence and they continue to go through punishing immigration experiences and perpetuating racial disparities. I invite you to learn more about indigenous nations that care for the land you are on and where you might come from. Visit native-land.ca to learn more. Thank you. I'll hand it over to Jay right now. Thank you, Jin. Um, and we'll take the time to uh, also in acknowledge what is happening right now in Gaza as well. This is the 166 days of genocide and the 76th year of Zionist occupation of Palestinian homeland. Palestinians are still fighting for freedom that the war owes to them. Al-Shifa Hospital, um, Al Hospital in North Gaza was attacked again, where journalists and medical staff were abducted um, and civilians were killed. Flower massacre continued happening for more than seven times. Israel settlers are mur murdering Palestinians every minute and there are people who sacrifice their career or even life to speak up and withdraw from being complicit in the access of genocide. Um, and we are having this teaching not for pure intellectual satisfaction, but also as an urgent call for action. Um, here's the agenda that I briefly mentioned in the beginning. Um, so we'll certainly leave uh, questions um, in the end, also um, some discussion as well. Um, I'd like to just quickly introduce um, Peace on to um, those of us who may be less familiar. Uh, we are a group of uh, Sinophone activists across continents. Individually, we work in different spaces of Palestine solidarity, organizing on campus, at workplace, in cities, or via publishing. Collectively, we work on educating on Palestinian resistance and ending Chinese complicity in Israel's occupation, apartheid, and war crimes against Palestinian people. Uh, we've been running a campaign to divest Hague vision from occupied Palestinian territories and apartheid Israel in general. Um, and here is the partition if you'd like to sign on um, and welcome to visit our Instagram to look at the organization petition as well because uh, so, there are individual and organizational uh, petitions separately. Um, and we'll leave some time in the end uh, to bring that to this page as well. And um, and really want to lay down uh, uh, for the importance of our conversation today. Um, as we educate ourselves in Palestinian struggles, uh, we feel a strong imperative to decolonize ourselves more deeply and connect the struggles in Palestine and also at home. Um, this talk is rarely held for urgently necessary discussion. In the past few months, we've seen radio silence, if not straight out support of Zionism from Chinese overseas dissident community 
who's been vocal to come uh, advocate for activists who experience state violence, as well as on ethnic cleansing of Uyghur and Turkic Muslims. In the case of Palestine, they put themselves to Zionist interests by spreading the lies and demonizing Palestinian resistance. Um, and that's, at the same time, within Palestinian solidarity organizing scene, especially in the United States, we've seen statements that because of the Chinese state pro-Palestine position, dismisses the violence of internal colonialism of these states. We've also seen the state propaganda tap into the Gaza genocide committed by the U.S. to cover up its own crimes and deny the cultural genocide and mass incarceration in Uyghur uh, homeland. We hope that this teaching could bridge some gap. Um, we also hope that there will be more activists putting attention to Hick vision, the policing regimes that it facilitates and the complicity of technology in general. And this is why um, it is such an honor to have Dr. Darren Byler with us today. Dr. Darren Byler is an anthropologist of state power, policing and incarceration and infrastructure of surveillance in global China. He is assistant professor of international studies at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. Through his two-year fieldwork, Byler has built bonds with Uyghur and other Turkic Muslim communities in northwestern China and has written extensively about the ongoing oppression of Muslim minorities in China. So you'll see that we have listed the titles here. Um, he is the author of Terror, Capitalism, Uyghur Disposition, and Masculini uh, Masculinity in a Chinese City, and In the Camps, China's High-Tech uh, Penal Colony. His ethnographic uh, graphics have been critically important for Han people like us to understand the political economy of Xinjiang and Uyghur people's struggle from a decolonial approach. He's also the co-translator of Backstreets, a novel by Uyghur writer uh, Perhat Tursun, who has been dis disappeared and imprisoned by the Chinese state until today. So um, it is with Fisan's great honor that uh, we'd like to um, have Dr. Darren Byler take over the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. It's a real honor to be here with you. This is such an important conversation. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're having it. It's not an easy conversation to have, but it's an important one. Um, it's not easy because it's it's horrific and also because it's complex um, and for all the reasons you just laid out. Um, but the program today, the talk I'm going to give is um, thinking about Palestine and its relationship to, quote unquote, Xinjiang, the, the new frontier, what some Uyghurs refer to as East Turkestan, and understanding how settler colonialism and the surveillance state are interconnected in both of these places. I'd like to start by reading just a, three paragraphs from the Chinese translation of my shorter book, In the Camps. Um, not going to read it in Chinese. I'm going to read the English translation of the Chinese. Um, it, it, it features this man, Pan Yue. <clears throat> in his 2002 dissertation, Dr. Pan Yue, the current commissioner of China's Ethnic Affairs Commission, proposed that a mass migration of 50 million Han people to Tibet and Xinjiang would simultaneously address three major problems confronting China, overpopulation, demand for resources, and the problem of ethnic and religious difference. Quote unquote problem, that's how he framed it. Pan, Pan who, had, uh, who, who became the first non-ethnic minority commissioner, the first Han commissioner of ethnic policy in the history of the People's Republic in 2022, suggested that Han migrants should be considered reclaimers of the Uyghur lands. The backwardness, quote unquote, of the frontier, he suggested, had become a danger to national security, fostering terrorist and extremist activity in the post 9-11 world. He called on China to learn from a trifecta of contemporary colonizers, the United States, Israel, and Russia. Taking elements of each, as a model of how contemporary China should colonize Tibetan and Uyghur lands, he suggested the, that the Western expansion of settler colonialism in the United States and Russia's imperial settlement of Siberia should be combined with the more contemporary example of Israel's controlled deployment of West Bank settlers and infrastructure in the occupied territories of Palestine. Finally, drawing on a model that Drawing from a model of, of China's post-Maoist legacy of state 
managed economy and export oriented development, Pan proposed that minorities should be proletarianized through assigned industrial labor. So they should be put to work in factories. In his study, it was clear that Pan wanted to combine a land grab with the dissolution of the Maoist system of ethnic minority autonomy within a socialist political and economic system. He was thinking comparatively about the world system of global capitalism, not as an object of critique or something that should be opposed, but as a way of understanding mimetically or in a, a form of mimicry, what China's place in the world should be within it. That China should be a capitalist colonizer, just like these other states. Part of what this implies, I argue in the, in the book, is that Pan's post-ethnic framework called for the abolition of the limited protections of difference that the Mao era had fostered, and as in the US and Russia and Israel, the replacement of civil liberties and autonomous claims for Muslims and indigenous citizens um, with markers, replacing those claims with markers of imagined evil the figures of the terrorist and the proto-terrorist, the terrorist waiting and hiding, the non-secular backward other. So, you know, this person, Pan Yue, is now in charge of ethnic policy in China. And he's saying all of these things about how China should learn from Israel, should learn from the United States, should adopt anti-Muslim racism as policy. My books, you know, came before some of what Pan proposed um, uh, or before it was sort of implemented as it has now been implemented. Um, but it speaks to this process of adapting global discourses, global tactics, global technology uh, for new purposes in a Chinese context. And then it also speaks to the way that that, that technology begins to travel and how it, how it moves from, from China to Israel, um, how Israel's framing of, of what it's doing to Palestinians moves to China. There's a, a constant dialectic, a back and forth between, between these two states, as well as other states that are doing similar things. My work, as has already been mentioned, draws on two years of fieldwork in the region. Um, over a, a, a decade, um, my last visit to the region was in 2018, um, which was after many of hundreds of thousands of, of Uyghurs had already been disappeared, been taken to what were called re-education camps um, by, by the Uyghurs that I met. Um, and then in 2020, I went to Kazakhstan to interview people that were coming across the border, who had many of whom had been in the camps themselves. So I've drawn both Uyghur and Chinese language interviews. I speak both languages to varying degrees. Um, many of my interviews and, and people I, I've learned from are, are in the Uyghur community. Um, some of them are, are some of my closest friends. But I've also become friends with, with Han people who are opposed to what's happening and trying to resist it in certain ways, that they, you know, what they can. in you know, from inside China, um, and also government contractors, people that uh, build and implement the system. I also worked with a, a journal called The Intercept for a couple of years, looking at internal police documents um, that had been um, obtained uh, by the journal um, from a company called Landosoft, which advertises itself as China's Palantir, which is one of the, the largest policing uh, companies and military um, intelligence companies in the United States. Um, but Palantir, or sorry, <laughs> Landosoft uh, had built um, the Rumchi mobile policing system. Um, and so it, all within these internal files are very detailed documents describing who's being detained, how they're being detained, how the surveillance system works, um, the capacities of the system, and how the system was built. Also, we've looked at lots and lots of, of government documents and industry documents to sort of corrobor corroborate things that um, my interviewees told me. So the story of what's happened in, in Northwest China really starts in the 1990s, which is when um, China was becoming a manufacturer for the world and needed raw materials to drive their economy. And so we see 
uh, mass migration of Han people uh, to Northwest China during this period um, that was incentivized by corporations and by the government. Um, and when those people arrived, um, they began a process of uh, building out the infrastructure, uh, building the roads and the pipelines, and eventually the service industries that would support the resource extraction economy. Uh, this region is a source of more than 20% of China's oil and natural gas and maybe 40% of China's coal. So those are primary drivers. And then as the infrastructure was built, there was a turn to uh, uh, industrial scale agriculture, particularly in the southern part of the region. Really what they're doing is they are turning things that weren't part of the Chinese market into parts of the Chinese market, uh, which is something that Marx would describe as primitive accumulation or original accumulation. They're building a new frontier of China's capitalist economy. Um, and through that process, they are also building processes of, di of dispossession, um, institutional capture or domination, and, uh, and introducing new forms of occupation. There had been a, a Han presence in the north of the region uh, for a much longer period of time. Um, but it was only in the 1990s that large numbers of Han people began to, to move into the south, which is the Uyghur homeland, where the population is more than 90% Uyghur. And so that process um, is really what built the tension between the Uyghur population and, and, and the Chinese state and, and the settlers that have, were arriving. Um, it was first a, a kind of material enclosure system, all of this new infrastructure that began to push people out of their homes. Uh, land was, was um, rezoned. Uh, the same processes that happen elsewhere in China, but in this context, it was something done by the Han settlers to the Uyghur population. And so it was experienced as a process of dispossession that was um, undermining the way of life that Uyghurs had. Um, over time, other kinds of enclosure, which I'll mention, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a minute, uh, of digital enclosure and, and uh, assigned labor also were built. Um, but initially it was just the material enclosure and then the institutional capture, which was the ways in which that the, the banking system, the, the education system, the grassroots political system were all uh, captured by this new population of people. And so Uyghurs who in the past during the Maoist period had a representation in the local pol political system uh, now saw themselves being pushed to the side. And, and so, um, they saw themselves being disempowered. They also saw the, the cost of living begin to rise because of the new population of people. But at the same time, a kind of apartheid system was being built uh, that excluded Uyghurs from the new economy, from the resource sector. Now, all of these structural issues began to produce really dramatic antagonisms between the Uyghur population and the Han population. And so there was a, a rise in, in violence. Um, Initially, that violence was around land dispossession, people protesting that, that land dispossession, and then protesting police brutality that responded to the protest, um, protesting uh, new restrictions on Islamic practice, which began to a larger degree after 2001. So October 11, 2001 is an important date for Uyghurs because it's one month after 2011, uh, sorry, 9-11, um, and it's... Um, it's the first time that a Chinese state official has referred refers to Uyghurs as terrorists. Prior to this, Uyghurs had been referred to sometimes as separatists or counter-revolutionaries or uh, local nationalists. Um, but now they were talked about in the same way that the United States was talking about Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. I was talking about the need to invade Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so Uyghur protest was reframed as terrorism and extremism. And this reframing means rewriting the history of the 1990s when there was already some protests. Those now were rewritten as terrorism in, in uh, Chinese state documents. Um, the naming of Uyghurs as terrorists or a small group of Uyghurs as terrorists called the East Turkestan Islamic Movement or party, which was based in Pakistan and was a small number of people, maybe three or 
three or four or five people um, who mostly had a, 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 a media presence um, and, and really had no capacity to carry out attacks. Um, the US designated that group a terrorist organization. And they also um, captured a number of Uyghurs who were in uh, Afghanistan, uh, who were given to the US military as a, for, in exchange for a bounty and took them to Guantanamo Bay, which is what you see uh, pictured here. Um, so the U.S. involvement in, in naming Uyghurs as terrorists helped to solidify the, the processes that were already happening in China. Um, fast forward uh, over a decade, and there's continued violence. There's a mass event in, in 2009 where there's street protests regarding the lynching of, of Uyghur workers in eastern China, um, which then turns into an inter-ethnic um, sort of riot, um, ethno-racial riot, um, with hundreds of people being killed. Um, then in 2014, there's an attack at a train station. It's called, you know, 3-1, uh, when uh, a group of Uyghurs uh, kill uh, more than 30 Han people, uh, just regular civilians. Um, and this is referred to as China's 9-11. You know, similar to the ways that Israelis are talking about October 6th and 7th as, as Israel's 9-11. Um, it precipitated uh, 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 what the, the Xi administration would refer to as the People's War on Terror, um, which meant a, a radical intensification of policing um, and, uh, and internment for Uyghurs. But at the same time as like there's these events that are happening on the ground, there's also uh, new discourses that are circulating in Chinese policing theory and military theory. Um, so already in the 2000s, you see uh, in the in in Chinese police academy documents how they're learning from Israel, how they're they're studying the in, the Second Intifada and how uh, China has responded to it, or how Israel has responded to it, and how China can learn from it uh, in its treatment of Uyghurs. Um, but I think there's an even more important source when it comes to military strategy, which is uh, European approaches to countering violent extremism, especially in the UK. Um, so this document, this book by uh, the CVE expert in the UK, David Lowe, is translated into Chinese. Um, and becomes kind of used as a model for how uh, Chinese police should understand the potential radicalization of Muslim people, that you should be watching, you know, how people carry out their religious life, whether or not they go to mosques or not, uh, how often they pray. Teachers should be mandated to track their students. Um, imams should be reporting. There should be informants in, in every community. Um, this is what they're saying in the UK. China is adapting that and 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 saying we're going to do the same thing. We'll, we'll do it better. Uh, we'll do it with Chinese characteristics. And so you see the this study called Studies in Anti-Terrorism in the Xinjiang Mode of Anti-Terrorism, which is basically CVE on steroids. <laughs> it's it's um, justification for the mass internment of anyone who you can. Uh, you have any reason to suspect of being um, pious and connected to what they call foreign Islam, which they say is a virus that's sweeping through the Uyghur population. Foreign Islam means like that you've studied the Quran without, uh, you know, outside of a state academy. Um, and it, it means that you're potentially learning from uh, teachers of Islam who are based outside of China or are in China, um, but are not given authorized um, permission to, to speak. Another aspect of this is that already, like all the way up until 2017, which was you know when the mass internment system really uh, took off, is that they the Chinese authorities are bringing in UK, UK experts on CVE um, to teach them how to do best practice. Um, how do you do this counterterrorism stuff that you're doing in Europe, and how can we adapt it to China? One of the things they were learning from the CVE discourse is how important signals intelligence is, how important it is to track everyone's behavior. 
uh, online. Um, so the, the the ways in which uh, big data, data valence tools, can be used to determine or diagnose potential criminality. And so there's this move to introduce something um, that could be referred to as a digital enclosure, uh, which is using state security and private industry uh, together uh, to build forms of, uh, of population management and control. Um, these systems can't just simply be plugged in and put to work. They need uh, a, a lot of human labor. And so to implement the system, they hired around 90,000 new security personnel. Um, and they also um, mandated civil affairs ministry personnel, which is sort of the social, social services um, system in China. Um, to act as volunteers to build the base data sets. So to go into all the Uyghur villages and track who's there, write down their names, take their pictures, um, build the, a, 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 a network within the, the policing system. Um, this is something that's happening right now in, China, in, in Israel as well, um, is the, the military there are, are mapping the Palestinian population um, to build a, a digital enclosure system. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the initial goal in the Chinese case was to break the autonomy of the Uyghur internet because Uyghurs were using Uyghur language and initially the censorship system in, in China couldn't pick up on what people were saying. And so they needed to build new tools that would automate the transcription, translation and assessment of Uyghur speech on apps like WeChat. Um, and they also needed to be able to detect uh, information and images um, and eventually they wanted to be able to uh, automatically detect Uyghur and Kazakh faces, um, mapping the phenotypes of those faces. So they're, they're automating forms of ethno-racialization. This is really important for tech companies because it gives them access to data, to state data, um, that's very symmetrical, that is very, uh, has the, it, it, they're you know data sets that really can't be replicated by um, by just scra scraping the internet, um, and so you get access to data. You also get access to state capital, and so what economists like David Young, who's at, at uh, Harvard now, has has shown is that um, within two years of developing state security projects, um, startup companies. Uh, develop commercial applications that build on those those public security contracts. So there's a, a really direct kind of connection between doing state security in China and and uh, becoming commercially lucrative, like building the you know the face the face recognition uh, unlock system for smartphones, for instance. Um, if you have a state contract, it helps you to accelerate that. It, the tech companies were also adapting Israeli tactics. Um, so uh, one of the, the most uh, used devices in Xinjiang was, um, was uh, this tool, which was built, built primarily by Mia Pico, that sort of reverse engineers or replaces Israeli Celebrite cyber hacking tools. So initially, Chinese security was using Israeli technology. Um, but as is Israel started to stop to sell, stop selling things to China as they were getting international pressure, um, and because China wants to develop its own technology, uh, Mia Pico and others began to reverse engineer and build their own tools. Um, these are data valence tools that can be plugged into the person's phone and scanned through their digital history, looking for over fifty thousand markers of uh, banned material. So it looks at the person's uh, QQ and WeChat and Weibo accounts um, and many other things that you've installed. Um, through these scans, over 1.8 million Uyghurs, according to a state document, were found to have an illegal app on their phone. Um, and these diagnostic tools also give a reading of green, yellow, and red, um, and red being that the person should be detained, something that then gets replicated in the face recognition system. If people are determined to be untrustworthy, which is the red code, um, they were often sent to camps like this one, uh, where they were held for long periods of time. These are really, you know, these are medium to maximum security prison spaces. Uh, they're extremely 
crowded in many cases. Um, and then they were moved. So this is the camp facility that you see in the picture. So there's a picture from the China Daily. And then right behind it is uh, this new uh, shoe factory center, uh, which is meant to be a new hub of, of shoe manufacturing. You can see that like the site of manufacturing is very close to the detention center. And this is something that you see replicated throughout the entire region. There's over 300 of these kinds of facilities. Um, there's a direct correlation between the re-education camp and uh, factory work. Um, and so we see hundreds of thousands of people being detained and then put into factories. Another 600,000 people were put directly into prison um, or were criminally prosecuted. Outside of the camp and prison system, the, a system of checkpoints was built. These were built by a company called CTC, which is China's Electronic Technology Corporation, which is the parent company of Hikvision, which is uh, the world's largest manufacturer of, of surveillance cameras. Um, and so CTC built these data doors and face scan checkpoints where you scan your ID and have your face matched to it. I went through a number of these when I was in the region in 2018. And what I see in the police data uh, from the intercept is images like this, where uh, Uyghurs are being pulled to the side while Han people, which you see in the line behind this young man, uh, continue to walk through what's called a green lane in, in the checkpoints. And so you see that even at the checkpoints, um, a kind of, uh, the. The checkpoints are actually the ways in which you see the clearest example of how an apartheid system is built, where one group of people based on their ethno, racial, and citizenship categories um, are pushed through the convenient line while the others are uh, forced to be further examined and, often, and subject to, to detention. Um, the internal police data shows the capacities of the system, showing that um, they have a lot of certainty around um, image matches that they pick up at these checkpoints. 99% sure that it's a, it's a match. Um, and they also show um, people in the moment of detention. So this person here is getting a red code at the checkpoint um, and will likely be detained immediately after this. The system is meant to make everyone searchable so that all citizens in Xinjiang should be no should be able to 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 be seen, particularly the the the, the targeted population, which is the the Uyghur and Kazakh populations. Um, that you can search their name or their ID number and know where they are at any time. Um, and then there's also automated um, tracking systems, so you can see deviation in behavior if someone is under a kind of neighborhood watch or neighborhood. Uh, arrest, um, and you can see if there's violations of parole. This is something that is happening in many places in the world as alternative to detention systems are being used uh, in the United States. There's you know, hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers in the U.S. who are being tracked by, by devices that are similar to this. This is also what's being used uh, to target Palestinians. Um, in the uh, industry documents uh, uh, from these tech companies, we see a lot of discussion of how what they're building in Xinjiang shouldn't stay in Xinjiang, that it should travel elsewhere. They talk about how the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is China's international development initiative, contains 60% of the world's Muslim population. And so the security industry in Xinjiang presents a market opportunity that's huge and uh, with huge and unlimited potential. The, the implication is that wherever there's Muslims, these kinds of tools should be used because uh, Muslims are inherently a threat. They're inherently extremists, inherently terrorists. Um, and so having safe city systems that will track their, their, their movement and their ability to live um, or the ways in which they live uh, is essential if you want to have um, a safe society. Uh, so this is how the industry is presenting itself, that this is what they want to do. And we see that they are doing it. So Mia Pico, the, 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 uh, the data valence company that is trying to compete with Celebrite, the Israeli company, is now uh, you know, using the Belt and Road as a way of, of finding new markets for its tools. They're doing trainings uh, all around the world, uh, but particularly in the global south. Um, and so you know, 
these kinds of, uh, of these kinds of tools, which can be used to track people's digital behavior and, and past digital life, um, are now being manufactured and sold at scale. Hickvision is another company uh, that is also beginning to market its things uh, around the world. Around 25% of its sales are now ex uh, related to exports. It's working in 190 countries. Um, its parent company is CETC, which I mentioned earlier, and it, it, that is what builds the integrated joint operations platform in Xinjiang, which is the largest sort of uh, data assessment tool that is connected to all of the other surveillance uh, systems. Um, and Hikvision built was the second largest contractor to build the biometric surveillance safe city systems, received $270 million, $75 million in contracts to build um, you know, population assessment systems that had this color-coded stopwatch, stop stoplight system of green, yellow, and red. Um, these systems went from the mosques and transit centers and cities to the camps that are connected to, um, to those locations. Um, they also developed tools to automate the detection of Uyghur faces. I mentioned this already, um, along with many other um, uh, computer vision companies in China. So um, just to really narrow in on the comparison between uh, Xinjiang and Israel, uh, if we follow Hikvision sales, we see that uh, Israel is now a, a primary uh, market for the company. Um, they have a Hikvision Israel website and they have another distributor named H HVI um, that, that is selling their tools uh, to the Israeli military. There's 54,000 camera networks, uh, Hikvision camera networks in Israel as of 2021. There's likely more now. Um, and they're the primary, a primary service provider for the Israeli Red Wolf face recognition system. Um, which is a system used in Hebron in the in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem um, to uh, to track movement through the infrastructure system through transportation um, and at checkpoints. Uh, these systems are meant to alert police, alert mil the military to potential incidents in real time so they can be responded to before anything actually happens. Um, it, of course, can also just track people who are on watch this. And we see in uh, the data that's being produced uh, through the system um, and through other research that um, that this system is also producing a, uh, a stoplight system of green, yellow, and red, with red again being the the uh, untrustworthy category, where Palestinians who are in the red category should be immediately detained. Um, it's integrated with a Blue Wolf system, which is uh, the mobile policing system. It's the interface that the po Israeli police and military carry on their phones. Um, and both of these systems are then integrated with something called the Wolfpack system, which is the, the data in integration system. The, the, the thing that's similar to uh, the, the joint operations, uh, the integrated joint operations platform in Xinjiang, the thing that was built by CETC. So what the Israeli military say about the Wolfpack system is that it um, makes Palestinians searchable in real time. It has automated capacities that looks at patterns in movement um, it is able to um, locate you, they are able to locate people anywhere, anytime uh, in the past um, and in the present and predict where they'll be in the future using the system. Um, there's some great scholarship that you should be looking at if you want to know a little bit more about how these systems are used and their effects on Palestinians uh, in in their usage, a um, friend of mine, a, an anti-colonial scholar named Sophia Goodfriend, who's a Jewish American scholar and went to Hebrew school as a child. And so uh, now as she's doing her research in Israel, uh, can speak Hebrew and is Jewish. So all these generals and police, people working in the intelligence units are actually happy to talk to her. 
um, until maybe they figure out what she's that she's going to critique what they're saying. Um, and so she has really unprecedented access to the the ways in which the the military talk and think about the building of these systems. And she's also um, you know, speaks Arabic and works in, with Arabic language. So she's going also into um, Palestinian homes um, to ask them how the surveillance is changing their lives. Um, there's a, if you don't have time to read an academic article, there's also a really great short piece from Al Jazeera that um, interviews Sophia um, and, and talks through how the wolf pack system works. This is what it looks like in the in, in the video. It looks like automation assisted apartheid. Um, you see children having their image captured. Sophia talks about how um, there's contests among different military units to capture the most images of people's faces and link them to their IDs. Um, that if you like, if you meet a certain quota or a certain number, then the military will get uh, a movie night <laughs> or other kinds of rewards. Um, there's also in the film, you see a discussion of like what this does to Palestinian families, um, how it really constrains or narrows the space that's available to them. Many people feel as though they shouldn't leave their homes because they'll be tracked immediately. Um, and if they have a family member who's in detention, a family member who's connected to Hamas or to uh, other government organizations in any way, um, then they are on a suspected watch list. Um, another piece that Sophia has written recently is on how um, how China's or sorry Israel's counterterrorism law has been expanded to to focus on forms of speech. So having uh, consuming or uh, possessing any materials that can be construed as um, as supporting. Uh, Palestine, supporting Palestinians, uh, supporting uh, the struggle in Gaza, um, or supporting people in Gaza, those those things are now criminal content that could be prosecuted or, or potentially be prosecuted. And so this system is is also affecting uh, Israeli Palestinian citizens. And people, you know, Palestinians who live in Israel have Israeli citizenship, the, the one and a half million that are there. Uh, chilling their speech, making it impossible or much more difficult for them to be uh, politically active. Um, the more tr the most troubling aspect of where technology is going in Israel, though, is in, in the way that data valence, the digital enclosure, is being used to assist in the, the automation of assassination, um, which is basically how they produce targets uh, in Gaza. Uh, so we all know that it's what's what's happened there is the mass killing of civilians, um, but they are using automated systems to choose their targets, knowing that civilians will be killed, but having some justification in doing the killing because they are able to geolocate um, some number of Hamas um, or you know just low level workers uh, in the in the Hamas government or somehow connected to. Uh, the militant wing of, of Hamas. Um, this is a really important piece written by um, a colleague of Sophia's at uh, 972. And you should check it out if, if you want to know a little bit more. Um, in, in a general sense, how what's happening in Israel, what's happening in China is connected to the way that surveillance work, state security is becoming another form of tech work. How working in state security uh, is part of building a career in technology, uh, and you know, as a, a, a technologist. Uh, and so you see this in Israel in, in the way that um, because the mili military service is, is mandatory, um, people choose in high school to study technology um, to um, prove that they will be a good fit for the intelligence units because they understand that once they get into the intelligence units, they'll be able to move very quickly from, from that to uh, a tech company after the military. And there's also this back and forth in terms of like intelligence units being structured as tech companies and tech companies contracting with intelligence. The same is happening in China. Um, the, uh, much of what was built in Xinjiang was built by private companies, but they work directly with the Public Security Bureau. And so there's this back and forth, people moving between uh, the private sector and the and the state security sector um, all the time. We see the same happening in the U United States with you know Palantir and other companies working directly with the military. 
Um, people who have in high income um, positions you know, as as they're being drafted into the military are often those that end up working in in these intelligence units in Israel. Um, it's also a pathway for um, social mobility and economic mobility in China. Tech is a huge part of the of the Israeli economy and the Chinese economy. In Israel, 14% of all Israeli workers work in tech, so over 500,000 people. 48% um, of Israeli exports are technology related, most of it around um, cyber hacking and security systems, um, digital forensics. It, it produces 71 billion US dollars. Uh, uh, for the Israeli economy. Um, in China, um, investment in artificial intelligence, there's a, a planned approach to this um, from the Xi administration, which is by 2030, they will invest 150 billion US dollars in AI research. And they hope that AI will bring $7 trillion to China's GDP. Um, a lot of this is uh, one of the when, when it comes to data valence um, and or you know mass data analytics tools, a lot of this is focused around safe city systems and an, a, an attempt to compete with Israel and the United States. Um, there's a lot of other things that are being built by AI in China. So they're also the 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 leader now when it comes to when it comes to electric vehicles um, and other. Uh, you know, it, approaches to environmental, um, you know, to green energy and the environment. Um, so I'm not trying to say that like all of China does is build surveillance. Um, I'm just saying that it's also building the same things that Israel and the United States are building and trying to export them um, to, to, especially to global South countries where, where they can, they have tighter trade relations often and also they can sell them at a, a lower price point. So that's most of what I wanted to share with you. Um, the the point of of what I'm talking through is that this is that we should think about China and Israel and United States at the same time and understand that all of these are doing all these states are modernist states, which means that they are built around an imperial formation, that they uh, center around maintaining power, power for those that are already, you know, those that are already benefiting from the society. And so if we see China doing the same similar things to what we've seen in other colonial situations, we shouldn't be surprised. Um, this is what modern states do. Um, we need to be able to oppose these things simultaneously. And I think one of the ways to get at that is to show these interlinkages, how these things move in very specific ways um, and you know, understand what this means on the ground. It produces extreme brutality, which is a normalization and unthinking of violence um, it justifies in Israel mass killing, in China mass internment, um, and we need to, if we care about abolition, we should care about both of these cases at the same time. Um, we should you know, work to abolish the, the police and the prisons everywhere, um, and we should also be tuned in to emergencies in the world um, where, you know, as, as now in Gaza, uh, atrocities are occurring. So I'll stop there and looking forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Darren. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate the presentation. I think um, as all of us uh, are here, maybe in various degree of understanding, um, you know, East uh, um, Turkestan um, issue um, and also just the oppression that happens in uh, in China, in Israel, uh, in Palestine, and also in the U.S. I think something that really stood out to me was the path tracking, right, and how that that really is the case um, in China um, against all the the oppressed. Um, so it's uh, and I'll speak, you know, more in the end of some of in my calls to urge people, you know, really look out as we are given as we are spoon fed this narrative of safe city. Um, who is it? Who are we protecting? And who are the most discriminated against and the vulnerable that is that are being oppressed? Um, so yeah, I think this is a great time for us to transition into our Q and A session um, portion. I know we've had some uh, questions that were submitted ahead of time um, that uh, are 
um, that ZZ will help us uh, bring them up. And then we will also look at the uh, questions that were submitted live as well. So ZZ, if you don't mind unmuting yourself. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Darren, for uh, very, a very informative talk and a very timely and important one. And um, I do want to address um, one of the things that you said at the end of the presentation regarding um, the fact that a lot of contemporary movements don't usually um, bridge the two struggles together. And um, for reasons that we know, right, um, they're like, plenty of binaries between say um, democracy, authoritarianism, between socialism slash communism and liberalism that movements usually organize around. And so these binaries really make it almost unimaginable to think about the fact that all modern nation states, as you said at the end, regardless of regime types, ideologies, or whether they're located in global south or global north are settler colonial and imperialist or, or uh, mimicry in in your in your word as well, and so from this premise, we can say both the Uyghur struggle and Palestinian histories of resistance start from when the first settlers set the feet on the land, right? And so my question is more broadly about the kind of historiography of counterinsurgency and contemporary surveillance studies. Um, and you know, as made extremely clear in the political discourse around Palestine here in the belly of the beast, we, we want to be really careful about how we start thinking about the history of all this. And as we see in your talk, you know, counterterrorism and counterinsurgency are super interconnected and more often than not interchangeable. But um, as we observe kind of in the critiques of surveillance capitalism, you see contemporary academia and the NGO industrial complex, including um, Amnesty International, tend to focus solely on counterinsurgent techniques without first addressing insurgency against colonization and capitalist racism to begin with. And um, I always have that kind of question of, um, or the fact that these discourses prioritize discussion of anti-apartheid as kind of civil rights agenda, meaning you know equity and shared power with colonizer over the kind of anti-colonial resistance, meaning land back and the end of colonialism by all means possible, um, which brings to my question of how do we contextualize this, you know, very informative and important research in the long history of resistance and what's the implications of surveillance studies for organizing um, anti-colonial insurgency? Um, I know this is kind of a difficult question, but um, a question that very relevant to, to people who has been in the organizing scene and um, want to think about these questions um, as both academics and organizers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are good questions. Um, in terms of the history of counterinsurgency, um, it, it really begins with the post-colonial movements of the 1950s and 60s um, as to like when, like you know, prior to this, there might've been like, discussion of guerrilla warfare or something like that or you know they, they continue on the same time but counterinsurgency is the french algerian case which you see in the battle of algiers the film um that is a, a primary example of of how uh states and military start to think about how the need to map population because you need to know where everyone is in order to figure out who's insurgent who's kind of in the either or category uh and that the 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 majority of people um and those who are counterinsurgent which are the collaborators among the colonized populations um and there's a number of tactics to get at this um one of them is mass detention and killing assassination of people who are seen as uh in key positions of power um and so you see this in the algerian case happening um, and then there's also uh, psychological warfare. So telling everyone that you know that you know the the insurgents are terrorists as a way of delegitimizing their um, claims, their uh, the you know the 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 um, the the structure of violence that they are confronting. Um, not acknowledging that, and then stay say, instead saying these people are irrational, they're backward. 
basically using all of the tropes of the colonizer, but you know, the reasons why we should colonize you is because you're heathen, you're backward, you're uncivilized, you're barbarians, you're brutes, all of those things. Um, and so the terrorist, the category of the terrorist is a contemporary instantiation of older colonial tropes. Um, and the global war on terror has moved that into a different space. It's re-legitimized colonial tropes, um, at least among the Western states. Um, and military theory, as it's been developed now, um, is saying that counterinsurgency or counterterrorism is the, like the only uh, mode of military uh, action that's available. And so um, that's how we see the spread, kind of a, what the scholar Madiha Tahir calls the distributed empire, <laughs> where the tactics and technologies of empire get taken up uh, everywhere in the world by every state, basically, that has a military. Um, so how do you organize in opposition to these things? It's it's challenging. I mean, one of the things that happens is because these things are happening digitally now, um, it means that they have a digital life that can be detected in almost real time. And so I could get these materials from the intercept and begin to show within like the space of several months what was happening just before. Um, so there's exposure that can happen. And you see the same happening in Israel now uh, with the reports I was talking about, um, that those are actually coming from the inside of the machine. There are, there are intelligence officers who are drafted into those positions who didn't, maybe initially didn't know what kind of work they were doing or maybe supported the work. They were inculcated in a Zionist uh, ideology, um, but became disillusioned with it. So even the reporter who's uh, Yuval Abraham, who is the one who did the expose on the mass assassination factory about how AI is being used in targeting in Gaza, like he's a former intelligence officer who's turned on his intelligence unit and is actually you know, getting intelligence folks within the unit to speak to him. Um, and so I guess that's one one uh, fracture in the system is you can you can work with technologists who actually built the basic science of these things and get them to expose their own work and also begin to uh, push for some sorts of change to de design um, tools for liberation rather than for harm. But of course, there's like a, a, a structure of incentive that prevents this from happening. So uh, it's really hard to get technologists to, to care. They will say instead that this is a political problem. It's not their problem. They're just building the tech and how people use it is up to them. Um, and so both in the Chinese case, you know, technologists have interviewed there and in the US, they would say in the most normative response is like, it's not our fault. Um, but there is people that understand that that it is their fault and that they they have power as they're designing these systems. And so I think tech won't build it is is a is a one one kind of response. But in terms of like you know how you help people that are on the ground in Gaza, um, how you help people in Palestine you know, in, in occupied territories in Palestine or in in Northwest China, that's a much more difficult um, thing to ask and you know a lot of it is supporting where we can the people that are um in diaspora and acknowledging the struggle that they're confronting and i think for those of us who are you know, you know i'm a white guy from ohio i'm a you know a settler scholar from ohio i'm not i'm not Uyghur. um it's not for me to decide uh what what the future for Uyghurs look like. I need to turn on the, the microphone for them. And so I, I tried to do that. Um, I think though, as activists, we also have a role to play. Like we, it's not as though we should stop thinking about what kind of world we want. Um, and so I think we can maintain our friendships with people uh, who are most targeted by these systems and yeah, try to push for the, the kind of um, political and economic systems that we want. Um, or that, you know, that our values show us are, are, are the, the values that will, will build the world we want. Um, so I think we have a role to play, even as we are, you know, allies or accomplices in struggle.
Thank you so much for your answer, Taryn. Um, so I have a couple of questions. I also combine it with the Q and A that the audience have. Um, the question is long. So, how do you see the campism narrative that believing in the re-education system in rural homeland serve as uh, supporting U.S. imperialism? And how do we dispel pro CCP erotic and claims that the rural genocide is a CIA propaganda from people who are within the pro Palestine movement? And how how can we create constructive conversation for people to learn about what is actually happening in that area and how to how can people build solidarity with uh, with the Uyghur community without feeling the U.S. right wing anti China agenda? And how do you see the prospect of building solidarity between Palestine and East Turkestan, given their respective support from the U.S. and China? And as scholar, as activists, what are our roles to build the solidarity? And how do you balance the needed critique of the Chinese state with rising xenophobia? <laughs> okay, um, those are all great questions. Um... So I think some of the polarization or the campism that we see in the world is is a result of some ignorance of not actually knowing the thing that we are positioning ourselves in, like against or for. Um, but there is also a, a real concern. I have the same concern about um, you know reproducing U.S. talking points um, and feeding forms of you know, anti-Asian, anti-Chinese racism. Um, those are, are concerns that all of us should have. Um, so I think in terms of like, you know, how do we under how do we build forms of solidarity between Palestinians and, and Uyghurs? I think we should, if we listen to what Uyghurs say, uh, which is also not easy because Uyghurs are being silenced actively and those who have a platform are not necessarily representative of Uyghurs. <laughs> um, it, so... I'll just give you a few examples. So when I was living in the Uyghur region, like one of the first questions people would ask me when I was meeting them for the first time is, what do you think about Palestine and Israel? Um, and they were testing me to see where my political loyalties lied, lay and and how I identified myself with, you know, the with colonial regimes uh, versus regimes of, you know, versus um the colonized with people that were being actively colonized. Also how I, you know, they were testing to see whether I was Islamophobic or not, but they also genuinely cared about Palestine. Like they were thinking about them often and also about people in Kashmir. Like they saw them as in very similar positions as, as they were in. Um, and I, I published something a, a week or two ago about a Kazakh mullah who Part of the reason, the most damning reason that the police found for why he should be given a 17 year prison sentence was because he possessed a book that professed to um, to the liberation of, of uh, Israel and Jerusalem. It was a, a pro-Palestinian book. Um, and so they said, because you have this book, we, we know for sure that you are a terrorist, <laughs> um, which is just crazy because then you see from the, US, from the Chinese state perspective, they're now saying that they support um, Palestinians. Um, but I think we have to understand that that is part of a proxy war. They see it as more of a proxy war with the United States. And I, I, I don't think, I mean, we can see with you know, facts on the ground where they are investing their money, um, that in actual fact, they don't necessarily care about Palestinian lives. So I think we can, we just have to, we have to take a non-statist approach to understanding the world and understanding the future we want. We have to simultaneously critique the US and China um, I try to do this in my work as much as I can, which means that I, you know, get disinvited from uh, certain uh, spaces, um, you know, especially right wing spaces, because they realize that I'm going to critique them while I'm also going to critique China. Um, so I think being able to do both simultaneously is 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 the task at hand. I I'm thinking back to. Um, a comment from Cornell West, uh, kind of along these lines, where he was, Cornell said that, you know, to do this work, we have to improvise. It's like jazz, <laughs> which is one of his favorite metaphors, um, that we need to, you know, be able to, to side on the side of the oppressed in every moment. Um, and that means not, you know, 
supporting a state that we see as um, a wedge or a political rival to another state that we oppose simply because of that opposition. We need to think about the communities that are most vulnerable, um, who are uh, the most targeted um, within all of these states and be on their side um, and think from their positions. That's not an easy thing to do. Yep, thank you, Darren. Um, I have a question. It's um, related to sanction, sanction as in BDS, but also as in you know the U.S. government sanction. Um, I'll keep it brief. So, as as probably we all know, the U.S. Um, federal government has been imposing various sanctions on high vision and Dahua for for over five years, um, where you know they ban. U.S. federal federal agencies from buying high vision technology, um, you know, from like barring U.S. persons from investing in high vision, and also more recently, um, high vision subsidiaries are prohibited from buying parts from the U.S. Um, and um, you know, the, the the concern about the so-called national security is is a recurring rationale behind it, and. We also see this um, in the recent TikTok ban, actually. Um, but but the way the ways in which the high vision is is used against Uyghurs and other Muslims in China is also another issue they factor in. Uh, and you know this is of course also because of the efforts from the Uyghur advocacy NGOs. Um, but the meanwhile, we also seeing the U.S. hypocrisy has never been clearer than ever in their genocide against Palestinians. Um, and so this makes people question if the U.S. government and the right-wing politicians are just weaponizing Uyghur human rights issues for their own anti-China agenda. So I, I'm wondering, um, what is your your view of the U.S. sanctions of um, of high vision, and is it really helping Uyghurs or or having that as as its goal? Um, and I think this is an important question to think about, um, also around BDS because. Um, you know, other than the grassroots boycott campaigns, the government level boycott is also one of the key strategies to to check apartheid Israel. And um, in the past few months, we have seen Malaysia ban Israeli ships from docking in Malaysia uh, as a form of sanction, um, as well as arms embargo in Colombia and the sea blockade uh, by Yemeni Houthis. Um, so do you think... Um, on the on the issue of um, oppressive technologies, um, should more countries just join the U.S. to have similar move in sanctioning high vision, or um, how could they sanction uh, or take action differently to to genuinely extend solidarity with both um, Palestinian and Uyghur people? Yeah, those are are good questions. The hypocrisy is is so stark uh, when you look at, at these two sites. Um, in general, in my work, I try to expand the object of critique to see to to to, to point out that like surveillance is not a Chinese problem alone. It's a U.S. problem. It's actually much of the technology used in China it finds its source in the United States. It's been adapted to new purposes. It's in a, a different political environment, but it's it's more or less the same technology. So we need to oppose that technology. There's no reason we need, you know, biometric uh, surveillance tools. Um, and they extend the power of the police, which we know is violence work. And the police order itself is anti-democratic. It's anti-people. Um, it's anti the people. So you know we need to oppose policing. We need to oppose the technology and its it, it, and its use in policing everywhere simultaneously. So we should boycott the United States. We should boycott China and we should boycott Israel. Um, that's like you know ultimately how things should be. Um, I think you know we should use all the tools we can, um, but. So I think the one example that you can turn to is the the boycott of of South Africa, which had a dramatic effect in terms of ending apartheid there. Um, 
but of course, like, you know, it was a capitalist boycott in a lot of ways of uh, of South Africa. So it wasn't like a transformational approach. It wasn't a revolutionary approach. It was, you know, we're going to oppose this one form of colonialism while we keep other kinds going at the same time, other wars happening at the same time. Um, so it it's a global problem, which means that it needs a global solution and global solutions are really, really hard uh, to even imagine. Um, but that's what we need is we need global grassroots movements and then we need regulation that meets those movements in some ways. Um, but getting there is really hard uh, and I don't have, uh, it's an open question. I don't actually have good solutions. Uh, ways of, of of addressing it. I think it's similar to how we're thinking about climate change and how we address that. It's, it's a global problem. We need everyone on board. Um, and there are some states that are doing better than others in addressing it. And, and so I think we can learn from each other. Um, I said earlier that all modern states are colonial or imperial states, and that is true, but they're not all equally the same in terms of the, the horrors that they produce. So there's also, you know, Colonization, imperialism, and anti-imperialism and decolonization are a dynamic thing. Um, and you know, some states have truth and reconciliation commissions that are somewhat surface levels, perhaps. Like I'm speaking from Canada, um, but because we have it, I can actually do decolonial work. I can talk about it in the classroom. I can push students in that direction, and um, and so you know, having a mandate from a state is useful. Um, so I think some regulations are useful. I think how it's being used in the U.S. is really around a new tech cold war. It's, it's, it's part of the U.S. war machine, uh, wanting more investment, uh, in opposition to this imagined China threat. Um, and unfortunately that's a lot of how the Uyghurs are being used, uh, in that regard. I think it's useful though, to not support Hickvision <laughs> in any, in any capacity, um, and so in that sense, I'm on, on board with, with a boycott or a sanction of it. Thank you, Darren. I think uh, we're ready to open the floor to the audience. So we have already collected a lot of great questions. Um, we may want to limit um, the time for each question because um, we only have 12 minutes left. Um, so the first question I see is that um, what do you see as the legacy of the 1960s and 70s anti-colonial in internationalist solidarity between the third world countries like China, Tanzania, and those oppressed in the U.S.? Um, the person feel like there is a romanticization of this mo uh, move moment and of the Chinese radicalism during the Mao period in the fields like China studies and Asian American studies that stifles uh, discussions of contemporary and historical Chinese oppression of ethnic minorities. Mm hmm well, um, so the third world is approach, I think, is a really important moment and something we're thinking about as, you know, what as a way of building movements or, you know, internationalist solidarity now. Um, I think China's role within it was was important, but it was mostly a space of refuge or kind of a third space. It was uh, l less, I think, central uh, in some ways to, um, you know, the role that was played by, uh, you know, but by, by uh, activists in places like Indonesia or Malaysia or Egypt, um, one of the things that came out of that movement was a, a a thinking, especially when you're thinking from Indonesia, about uh, thinking about infrastructure and shipping because that was how colonialism arrived for them, and so they were thinking that's what we should target. And so, you know, the Suez Canal was a, a point that they were focused on is like we should stop the we need to stop the the sinews of global capital the logistic system and so you see the same thing happening now with the the you know what the houthis in, in yemen are doing is using the weapons that are available to them the tools that are available them to them to uh, take a stand uh, against you know their 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 own historical experience of oppression you know the saudis were bombing them with us weapons as well um and so they're 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 taking a, a position i'm not necessarily advocating for it um but i think thinking about maybe worker strikes at the docks like that's a way of of building on a third worldist moment 
because that's the sort of thing they were thinking about. There is often, I think, some romanticization when it comes to thinking about Maoist China, because, you know, if you talk to people that were there uh, at the time, there are some there are some folks that, you know, benefited from it and and and. and and felt as though there was political progress being made, but there was a tremendous amount of suffering as well. Um, There's a lot of um, factionalism. There was a lot of um, oppressive forms of power that were being uh, weaponized uh, in that moment in China. And so while it provided forms of support for third worldists elsewhere, I think it was also instrumental uh, instrumentalist in, in how it did um, at times. Um, but there's a lot more we could say. Uh, I think I'll just stop there. Thank you. Um, the other question from the audience is they're also interested in learning more about the normalized checkpoints that segregate Han and Wu people that also exist outside of the prison complex in Xinjiang and also apply to um, other parts of mainland China after or also during the COVID as an excuse. And also we have seen rising of this normalized surveillance around the world here in Canada, as well as in the US. And people who are in our like IG post comments say, what's wrong with CCTV? <laughs> Isn't that make us safe? Um, what do you think about this question? Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. The, que the person asking the question is absolutely right that um, these systems are now being normalized. Um, uh, you know, those, Public health surveillance around COVID had a certain logic to it. There was, there's, there's, you know, fairly good reasons why you would want to prevent the spread of pandemic and so on. Um, but what we saw in, happening in China is it's being used by local authorities in quite arbitrary ways, um, which is and in really oppressive ways, in ways that um, responded to kind of the black box of their assessment tools like their phones and giving them a certain code and then they would enact um, a response based on that code without actually necessarily looking at the science that was behind it. Um, and so people saw those systems used in, in really disempowering ways um, where they felt like they lost control of their own lives and of their families. There was a, a lot of violence. Um, and I think some of that capacity is now it continues on in, in China um, because once the tools are there and they're all integrated, it's not as though they go away after people after the state decides that they're no longer going to um, attempt to control the pandemic. Um, and so they can be used for political purposes. Um, all tech, many technologies are dual use or multi-use. Um, but I think surveillance technology is particularly dangerous because it's you know in in the word itself is the is the the framing of oversight, uh, the overseer. Um, it's a it emerges out of a slave economy and the plantation economy in the U.S. Um, and so it's it's about distribution of power, um, and uh, I you know, people want to have forms of safety. They want to have and I think that's a, something that is a value that we should want, but safety is different than security. Safety is something that comes from the community, uh, that responds to community needs, that is uh, addressing underlying issues within the community, things like housing and basic needs, education, jobs. Those are the things that need to be addressed, not a sort of treatment of the symptoms of security. That's, you know, this is what security does. Uh, because what security does is it establishes a police order, which means that it maintains the social order. So those that are excluded remain excluded. Those that are benefiting re continue to benefit. Um, and so it, it, it reproduces uh, forms of inequality. But I think we need to be really careful with the term security, also with the term terrorism, and think about what does it look like from the people that are excluded? Who Security for whom? Who is not getting? Who is made insecure by the security? Um, and even during COVID, we saw this happening to migrant workers. Insecurity being produced by the COVID restrictions, um, by for those who are differently abled from the elderly. Um, and so, think from those positions, and that will help us to think about what kind of technology use we want in a society. Um, thank you so much for your brilliant answer. Um, unfortunately, we only have five minutes. I don't know if we have still have time for 
I guess one more quick question. Um, um, yeah, I think we have one more <laughs> one more question. Oh, okay. Um, so the question I would like to shed light on is about the global kind of export of technology. So a person asked you, so spoke about the global export of this technology. Are the customers primarily state actors? Have you had any insight on the increase of this technology in the Europe? And also another person asked uh, whether we should extend this um, to India, where we are witnessing political violence against the minority Muslim and specifically Kashmir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mostly these are being sold to police police units, uh, these kinds of tools, and also to government units. Um, so the safe city systems are systems that are usually operationalized at the level of like an urban center, a metropolitan area, sometimes quite large, like, you know, it can include millions and millions of people. And they they are framed as part of a, a, a smart city system, which is about traffic management and waste management and um, you know the basic infrastructure of the city, something that um, the philosopher Michel Foucault would talk about as, as security, which is about the circulation of the things that you want and the lowering the rates of circulation of things that you don't want. Um, and so often it's it's uh, states and it's cities that buy these things um, and they buy them because they believe in security, um, but also they believe in ideas of progress that have been kind of inculcated in them um, through you know, rhetoric around modernization that like to have a global city, to have a cutting edge city, you have to have a safer or uh, uh, a um, smart city. Uh, and so um, there's these like this idea of progress and and their citizen support for that that you want to have um, a cutting edge city. Um, so there is buy in from regular folks as well that people that want security and and want the, you know new technology and like I'm on the side of technology also like I I like to use Wi Fi, I like to you know have access to the world of knowledge, and to be able to circulate knowledge. Um, it's just always the question of, you know, who benefits from these systems, who are excluded by them, what safe cities do in general is they exclude undocumented people, people that are racialized, they push them into ghettoized spaces, into the gray economy where they, you know, they can avoid surveillance. Um, and so it shapes the life path of those that are targeted by these systems or, or are banished by them. Uh, while at the same time, it provides us with this idea of feeling of security uh, as protected citizens. Um, and so we, under we should understand that our trade-off is that, that, we, you know, that people's lives are being directly affected by our uh, imagined sense of fear um, as protected people. Um, the other part of the question, I'm sort of forgetting what it was now, um, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it at that because I'm I'm blanking on the other part of the question. Um, in general, like these 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 systems are are systems that I think need to be rethought, and we need to think about them in a global level. Can you help me out, Jay, with the rest of the question, or maybe we should just cut it off? Yeah, I do think we're running short on time. Okay. Uh, yeah. But thank you so much, Darren, for um, you know uh, really really answering questions uh, up to now very much in length. Um, so I will end uh, just here on this post. I also understand that many people had a lot of questions that didn't get answered, and I encourage uh, we all to continue, you know, reading Darren's work um, and then learning about the uh, historical and the current context in this. Um, and then at the end, peace on uh, past and solidarity action network would like to urge the community, you know, to really center the voices of the oppressed and that's the Uyghur community, Palestinians, um, and also the, uh, the most vulnerable uh, in whichever country that you're in. Um, and really finding power in uh, your, even whether you're in academia, whether you're in corporate, I mean, all sorts of different networks, um, finding the people uh, within, um, and that's the community that we take care of each other rather than maybe clinging onto state um, and thinking that the enemy of our enemy is quite our ally, which is not the case, right, um, with, with the lots of the answer, uh, questions that we answered. And in the end, I uh, want to 
really uh, direct attention to the Hague Vision campaign that PSUN has uh, spearheaded. Um, sign the petition, find your local Hague Vision uh, office, um, you know, plug into local organizing, um, protest in various sorts of ways that you can do so. Um, and yeah, really, so it's a, it's a call to action uh, to the community that we'd like to end on. So thank you so much, everyone who have tuned in. Thank you so much, um, Darren, who have given us uh, the opportunity to ask you questions and give us the talk. Um, and we will follow up with more information after. Um, and yeah, everyone, please enjoy the rest of your day. And, um, and I think I'll end with, as we strive for free Palestine, Palestine is freeing us uh, of the all um, many forms of oppression that we see all across the world. So thank you all. And thank you to the panelist team for uh, holding this all together. So have a great one, y'all. Thanks for organizing.